Come on in and we'll get ready for our Bible study tonight. Good to see you. Let me open this up with a word of prayer. Then we'll have a couple of announcements. I'm already running one lady off. I got a couple of announcements and then, uh, and then we'll get started in our Bible study tonight. Let's pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for our day and the blessings of the day, the coolness of the air, the reminder that seasons change, things come and go, but all of those are in your design, your plan. God, we, uh, we want to just lift up tonight our youth and Jason and Neil and our praise band as they are leading at the county fair tonight, uh, Jason giving a, me- a gospel message, and so Lord, I pray tonight that uh, many will hear and that some will be saved, God, and we just thank you for that. Thank you for our meal that we've had together. We thank you for our students that are on campus and our children that are here, and God, may we just be glorified together as we read your word and as we uh, seek to be more what you want us to be. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, a couple of announcements. First of all, I was given a note to thank you for the blood drive that we did Monday. So we got 27 pints. I said gallons. That sounded better. But 27 pints of blood. And uh, we do that twice a year, four times a year, three. I can't see that far. So we do that three times a year. And uh, if you weren't able to be involved with that this time, uh, be watching and you can sign up next time. But that's a it's a great way to, uh, again, get people on campus and uh, use our facility for things that are very important. I uh, want to give you a couple of things to be thinking about and praying about. So get ready. Sunday morning, we've got five baptisms and uh, a bunch of kiddos to dedicate to the Lord. So Miss Becky told me I had about three minutes to preach. So... You come, on, you come on back Sunday morning and we will celebrate what God's doing in people's lives and we'll celebrate. Um, that's a great thing to do with child dedication, that God gives us children. We realize that they're His and that we can give them back to Him And because uh, we can't do nothing with them. He's going to have to do something with them. So be here for that. And then Sunday night at 4.30, the women have a special event right here. So ladies, you come back and bring your friends with you, ladies of all ages, it's uh, it's called the dwelling, and it's a worship experience, and uh, they uh, they share testimony and do skits and play music and the whole nine yards. So uh, you'll want to uh, you'll want to do that, ladies. You can leave your husband home, let him take care of the kids or whatever, and just come and be a part of it. It's a really good time of fellowship. Um, be getting ready for trunk or treat. It's coming up. I know Miss Becky's already been sending out some things. Uh, we're expecting a lot this year to, to come back since uh, we've kind of gotten back by COVID and things are kind of picked back up. So we're looking forward to that. And then this Saturday is game number four, Upward Football. So uh, we've only got two more games after this week. So if you thought in your mind, I'd like to come out there and just see what that's all about. It'd be a good time for you to do that. It'd be a great weekend. So come out and you can help or just come out and walk around and talk to people. That'd be a great help as well. Anything I'm missing, Brother Michael? Yes. So uh, when Neil went with the mission team last year uh, to Ireland, there were several people that went that said, man, I really wish I had known the history of Christianity in Ireland. And so Neil is, is trying to do an interest meeting this Sunday following the worship service. It'll just be an informal thing. You're not necessarily signing up, but you're just trying to get more information to find out what it would cost, uh, when the dates are, to see if you might be interested in going. And this would literally be just sort of a, uh, almost like going to the Holy Land. It would be go get on a bus, ride to places, look at it. Uh, study about what God did in Ireland and how that affected Christianity throughout the centuries. And so uh, if you're interested in that, that will be this Sunday after worship as well. You can talk to Brother Neil about that. Yes, ma'am.
Thank you, Ms. Shannon, for reminding us. So the Long Range Planning Committee, we haven't done a listening session in a while, and most of our long range plan that we had set up, honestly, a lot of it was fulfilled when we moved into the building and got things uh, set up the way we do. So we're kind of sending it a survey back out to our members and guests to just say, you know, help us dream. You know, what's the next thing? What, what do you see that Temple's doing well? What are some things that we could do better? Uh, just kind of dream with us. And so let me just challenge you to fill that out. And if you don't get one, let us know that you didn't get one. And we are going to have some printed copies for those of you who don't do email. Uh, we'll have some printed copies. We want you to fill it out and get it back to us. But what we know traditionally is that most people don't fill out surveys unless what? They're mad about something, right? If you get bad customer service at a restaurant, you'll fill it out. But if everything went good, you really just don't even take time to fill it out. Well, I hope you're having good experiences at Temple Baptist Church, but we do want you to fill it out. Uh, this is not an opportunity for you to say the preaching could be better, okay? It's not that kind of survey. This is ministry opportunities and things that we could do. How can we reach out into our community better? Uh, things that you love about Temple, things that we could improve on. So uh, be looking forward to that. should go out sometime this week, next week, tomorrow. That's this week. So should go out tomorrow. So if you don't get that in the next couple of days, uh, let us know. We'll get you a copy of that. All right. Anything else? It's a busy place around here. I'm tired already. Just all the announcements. All right, so let's get into our study tonight. We have uh, been looking at the Old Testament just kind of book by book, and we may get done by 2026 through all of these, uh, but it's been really interesting and just a really good study just to remind us of these overviews of uh, what God has given to us in His Word. Hey, I spent a lot of time today uh, electronically working with some of my uh, stuff that I can do. Look, look what I can do. I can, I can draw if it's going to come up. Look at that. That is so cool. Y'all are not that impressed. But we are in the second part. We're looking at the books known as the historical books, and we're looking at what God has to say through, through those things. Tonight we're going to look at First and Second Kings. First and Second Kings. What is interesting is that in a Jewish Bible, it would have just said the kings. It was the book of the kings. So as you can imagine, what mostly is in there is about the different kings over Israel and how they fared and what they did. Um, but when the Greeks got the Hebrew text and they translated it into their language, well, the Greeks were more... Um, they're more detailed in their words, like with love, we have five words for the word love. And so the Hebrew was also written uh, on scrolls, and they did not use, I don't know how they did this, but they did not use any vowels. It's all consonants. It's all consonants, but there's a reason for that. It helped preserve the space. Go home tonight and type a letter and don't use any vowels, and look how much space you will save. So... When the Greeks got it, they began to put in vowels and make it into their language. And so all of it wouldn't fit on one scroll. So then they had the scroll of 1 Kings and then the scroll of 2 Kings. Because if you had a scroll that had everything that the book of the Kings had in it, it would have probably looked like a carpet roll. And you couldn't carry that from town to town. So that's the reason we have 1 and 2 Kings. A key thing for us to remember about the book of Kings is that one of the things it's going to show us is that these men fail miserably, almost unanimously. There's some high points, and we'll talk about that, but they fail miserably throughout the history of Israel. And that is just, again, a constant reminder. We see in the garden, Adam fails, right? And then we begin to see that God uh, raises up people to help Noah does a good job building a boat, but he gets drunk at the end. In some ways, he fails, right? His boys, in some ways, they fail. And then God begins to raise up the judges. The judges, don't, they don't lead exactly the way God wants them to. Some of them do good, but then there's some things within their uh, ministry that's bad. So one of the things that you begin to see through the Old Testament 
is that the prophets don't always prophesy correctly. They don't always do correctly. They don't always live correctly. The priests don't always priest correctly. They don't always communicate correctly. They don't always follow within the rules correctly. The kings, as we're going to see tonight, fail miserably almost across the board. And one of the things that we are beginning to see is that humanity was in desperate need of a Savior. Desperate need of someone. So we know today, we know Jesus is our prophet, our priest, and our king. And so as we look at the book of Kings, one of the things you just kind of have to keep in your mind is that the kings fail, but our king, Jesus, doesn't fail. And God had warned them about that. If you want to look at this scripture with me just real quick, in 2 Samuel or in 1 Samuel, God had told them that this is what's going to happen to you if you have these kings. These are the rights of the kings who will rule over you. He will take your sons and put them into his chariots on his horses or running in front of his chariots. He can appoint them for his use as commanders of thousands or commanders of fifties to plow his ground or reap his harvest or to make his weapons of war or the equipment for his chariots. He can take your daughters to become perfumers, cooks, and bakers. He can take your best fields, your vineyards. So God had warned them. Remember, they wanted a king. They wanted a king because they wanted to be like everybody else. And God had warned them, if you choose to put these men over you, let me just go ahead and tell you, it's probably not going to go well for you. And that's exactly what we see through the book of Kings. So let's watch our video and then we'll talk a little bit more about some of these unique characters in this book. The books of mm, don't hit it twice, just hit it once. First and Second Kings, although they're two separate books in our Bibles, they were originally written as one book telling a unified story that continues on from the book of Samuel that came before it. So David has unified the tribes of Israel into a kingdom, and God promised that from his line would come a messianic king who would establish God's kingdom over the nations and fulfill the promises made to Abraham. So the book of Kings tells the story of the long line of kings that came after David, and none of them lived up to that promise. In fact, they run the nation of Israel right into the ground. The book is designed to have five main movements. The story begins and ends focus on Jerusalem, first with Solomon's reign and the construction of the temple, and then in this last section ending with Jerusalem's destruction and Israel's exile to Babylon. And the story leading up to this tragedy is what makes up the center three sections, which explain how Israel split into two rival kingdoms, how God tried to prevent the corruption of Israel by sending the prophets, and how exile became the unavoidable consequence of Israel's sin. The book opens with two chapters about the kingdom passing from the aging David to his son Solomon. And David's final words to Solomon, they're very similar to those of Moses and Joshua and Samuel to the people. It's a call to remain faithful to the commands of the covenant and to give allegiance to the God of Israel alone. But David's words ring somewhat hollow here because David and Solomon then go on to conspire how they're going to consolidate this new kingdom through a whole series of political assassinations. It's not off to a great start. Solomon's brightest moment comes when he asks God for wisdom to lead Israel. And he even completes David's dream to make a temple for the God of Israel. Here the story actually stops and describes the design of this temple in detail, just like the tabernacle design in the Torah. There's all these gold and jewels and depictions of angels and fruit trees. It's all symbolism echoing back to the Garden of Eden. It's the place where heaven and earth meet, where God's presence dwells with his people. But no sooner does Solomon finish the temple that he makes some really horrible choices and the kingdom falls apart. He starts marrying the daughters of other kings, hundreds of them, for political alliances. And then he adopts their gods and introduces the worship of those gods into Israel. Solomon then accumulates huge amounts of wealth. He builds a huge army. He even institutes slave labor for all of his building projects. Now, if you go back to the Torah and look at God's guidelines for Israel's kings in Deuteronomy 17, Solomon is breaking every one. So by the time that he dies, Solomon resembles Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, more than he does his father David. 
The next section of the book opens with Solomon's son, Rehoboam, acting just like his father. It's a very sad story of greed and lust for power. He tries to increase taxes for slave labor. And under the leadership of Jeroboam, the northern tribes reject this. They rebel and secede and form their own rival kingdom. And so now in the story, you have the southern kingdom, Judah, centered in Jerusalem with kings from the line of David. And now this new northern kingdom called Israel, whose capital will be Samaria eventually. Jeroboam also goes on to build two new temples to compete with Solomon's temple in the south. He puts a golden calf in each one to represent the God of Israel. The connection to Exodus 32 and the golden calf, it's all quite explicit. From this point on, the story goes back and forth from north to south, tracing the fate of both kingdoms. Each one had about 20 successive kings, and as the author introduces each king, he evaluates their reign by a few criteria. Did they worship the God of Israel alone, or did they promote the worship of other gods? Did they deal with idolatry among the people? And did they remain faithful to the covenant like David, or do they become corrupt and unjust? And according to these criteria, the author finds no good kings in northern Israel, zero for 20. And then in southern Judah, only eight out of 20 get a positive rating, which connects to another huge purpose in this book, and that's to introduce the role of the prophets, key figures in Israel's history. So in the Bible, prophets were not fortune tellers. Rather, they spoke on behalf of the God of Israel, and they played the role of covenant watchdogs, which means they called out idolatry and injustice among the kings and the people. They were constantly reminding Israel of their calling to be a light to the nations, that they should obey the commands of the Torah, and so the prophets challenged Israel to repent and follow their God. In these center sections for each king, God then raises up prophets to hold them accountable. And the most prominent prophets are the northern ones, Elijah and his disciple Elisha, right here in the center of the book. Elijah was a wild man of a prophet living out in the desert, and his arch nemesis was the northern king Ahab and his Canaanite wife Jezebel. Together, these two had instituted the worship of the Canaanite god Baal over Israel. And so in a famous story, Elijah challenged 450 prophets of Baal to a contest to see which god was real. So they both build altars and pray to their gods, but only the god of Israel answers with fire. After this, Ahab uses his royal power to murder an Israelite farmer and then steal his family's vineyard. And Elijah again confronts Ahab's injustice and he announces the downfall of his house. Elijah eventually passes the mantle of his prophetic leadership to a young disciple named Elisha, who asks for two times the authority of Elijah. And what's fascinating here is how the author, he's recounted seven miraculous feats for Elijah, and then he offers stories of 14 acts of power from Elijah. Both prophets were clearly remarkable men, and they played the same role, confronting Israel's kings for idolatry and injustice. And ultimately, they were unsuccessful in turning Israel back from apostasy. In the next section, the northern kingdom is rocked by a bloody revolution started by a king named Jehu, who destroys Ahab's family. And although Jehu was at first commissioned by God, his violence just gets out of control, and it creates the spiral of political assassinations and rebellions from which Israel never recovered. Coup follows coup after Jehu, and each king follows other gods, allows horrible injustice. It all leads up to 2 Kings chapter 17. The big bad empire of Assyria swoops down and takes out the northern kingdom altogether. In the capital city of Samaria, it's conquered and the Israelites are exiled and scattered throughout the ancient world. Now chapter 17 is key. The author stops the story and offers this prophetic reflection on what's just happened. He blames the downfall of the northern kingdom on the idolatry and covenant unfaithfulness of Israel and its kings. And so God has allowed them to face the consequences of their decision. The final movement of the book tells the story of the lone southern kingdom. And here we meet some very heroic kings like Hezekiah, who trusts God when the armies of Assyria come knocking on Jerusalem's door. Or Josiah, who discovers this lost scroll of the Torah in the temple. So he starts reading it. He's convicted and he institutes religious reforms to remove idolatry and Canaanite influences from the land. But 
Judah is just too far gone. The king, right in between these two, Manasseh, he's the worst by far. So he not only introduces the worship of idol statues into the Jerusalem temple, he also institutes child sacrifice. And so God sends prophets to say, the time is up. Israel has reached the point of no return. The final chapters tell the story of the Babylonian Empire coming to invade Jerusalem, destroy the temple, and carry the people and the royal line of David off into exile. And so the story ends leaving us wondering, is God done with Israel? Is he done with the line of David? Well, the final paragraph zooms about 40 years forward into the exile, and it tells a very odd story. It's about Jehoiakim, a descendant from David, who would have been king if he was back in Jerusalem. And the king of Babylon releases him from prison and invites him to eat at the royal table for the rest of his life, and the book ends. So it's not much, but it's a story that gives a glimmer of hope that God has not abandoned the line of David. So the question now is how is God going to fulfill his promises to Abraham, to David? How is he going to bless the nations and bring the messianic kingdom? And to answer those questions, you have to read on into the wisdom and the prophetic books. But for now, that's the book of Kings. Now, I know on your handout, that's way too small for you to read. I get that. Um, but it's just a reminder, uh, you can go to BibleProject.com and watch all of these videos. If you can't remember that, you can go to YouTube, and uh, they're out there as well. But those are good, just kind of lead in. I, I would just encourage you, I mean, if you're doing uh, a Bible study somewhere, uh, they've actually got um, some smaller videos That's if, if you want to know about the birth of Jesus or... Um, Elijah's ministry specifically so it's a good it's a good tool to use on the front of your handout I tried to give you a, a few things just to note first of all the outline for kings we're going to start with the death of David and then it'll take us into Samson's reign then we'll start to see the division of the kingdom divided into the north and the south and then we're going to see captivity of Israel, the northern kingdom, by the Assyrians. And then we're going to see, finally, uh, the decline and the, or the Babylonians coming into the southern kingdom. So really what's kind of sad about this whole book is that we start with the glory of David and we end with two foreign kings, the Assyrian king and then King Nebuchadnezzar that comes in from the Babylonian side to, uh, to take over uh, what is uh, Judah. So let's look at uh, King Solomon just for a minute. Um, King Solomon's reign was kind of known as the golden age of Israel. If you think about what David had done, David had gone in and as a warrior king, that's the reason, remember, he couldn't build the temple because he had blood on his hands. But David had gone and really set up that the whole kingdom was sort of, uh, had some stability to it. And so a military presence and some stability. When Solomon came in, uh, Solomon was able to help the, the kingdom grow uh, intellectually. So their education system, uh, this, their, the way they set up civically. Uh, also, he built the temple. He helped build a navy. Uh, he helped build other uh, cities as well. So all of these, all of these things is kind of what King Solomon brings. And on the front end, Solomon is a very uh, astute uh, person that follows God. For example, at the beginning of his reign, God asked Solomon to ask him whatever he needed or wanted. Do you remember that? He said, Solomon, I will give to you whatever it is you want. Uh, and do you remember what Solomon asked for? Yeah, Solomon asked for wisdom. And God said, because you've asked for this, I'm going to give it to you, but I'm also going to give you the riches and the things that you probably wanted to ask for, but you were smart enough not to ask for. And so Solomon excelled a long time in his reign, but one of the things that happens is uh, he lets these influences uh, come into his life. You heard that he had all these wives and he let their uh, their religious beliefs come in. And so when you look at that he married 700 women and he had 300 concubines, uh, a lot of people kind of snicker and say, was he really that smart? Was he really that wise? Um, because that's, that's just a lot, isn't it? That's just a lot. And probably what he thought he was doing, uh, and you can see how it would happen in that day, 
I will marry one of Pharaoh's daughters so that Pharaoh and I will now kind of be connected as family. And Pharaoh definitely would not attack us because he could hurt his daughter. So there were some political reasons that he did that. But again, it, it caused a big problem uh, in, his, in his reign as king. Uh, but before we get to the bad parts of it, it was during this time that a lot of the poetry books that are in the Old Testament were written like the Psalms, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, Song of Solomon. And of course, Solomon wrote some of those. He is the last king of the United Kingdom. After him, we see that it's divided into the northern ten kingdoms and then the southern two kingdoms. Uh, he reigned for about 40 years. And there were a lot of highlights. The picture that's up there is, is one of the first stories that we really see in Solomon's, uh, in Solomon's reign. Do you remember that? That uh, there were two women, right, that comes to Solomon and they have this one baby and they claim, or they claim that one of the ladies claim that, hey, uh, we both gave birth real close together and uh, one of the babies died and now she's claiming that's my baby and I'm telling you, it, it's, or it's her baby and I'm telling you it's my baby and so there was this debate and Solomon has to answer the question of who this baby belongs to. Do you remember how he did that? Yeah, let's just, you know, let's just cut the baby in half, and both of you can take a half and go home. And uh, that way, you know, we've been fair to everybody. And uh, so the true mom said, no, I would, rather, I would rather the child live, right? I'd rather the child live. And so Solomon knew that that was the true mom. And so that was sort of the, that was sort of the things that you saw in his life. But he was really one of those rulers in his day that uh, affected the whole world. Uh, we know that the queen of Egypt came down to see him. And she was amazed not only at his, uh, his wisdom, but how he ruled and how his kingdom was run. So we know he did a lot of wonderful things, gained a lot of wealth. But again, toward the end of his, toward the end of his reign, uh, he let all of these evil influences come into his life. It is a, a good reminder to us, as I thought about this, what are, some, what are some key principles that you see that have affected all across time, all across the world? What are some key things that begin to tear down a nation? What are some key things that begin to tear down a nation? Pride, right? There, there is a false worship. And let's be honest, not everybody worships God but whatever their original worship was, they get away from it, right? They get away from their foundations. But ultimately, if you don't worship God, you're, you're going to fail. What else? Greed. greed, absolutely. Greed, pride, greed. What else? Love of money, Love of money. good. What else do you think? Power, Power. yeah. Yeah, you, you start to see that and you look, and you look at... World history, you can go back and you can study that. There's a rise when a, when a country begins to rise and they begin to uh, become successful and then they sort of establish. Um, I'll tell you this, um, we need to be on our knees praying about our country, amen? One of the wealthiest nations in the world, okay? Um, we had a good beginning, good foundation, but now it's gotten so silly that we don't, we don't know who we are anymore. We don't stand by our constitution. We stand by how we feel about a situation this way or that way. Pick, it, pick whatever you know, political thing you want to talk about tonight. But it typically is more about how we feel about something than the facts of the reality of something. And so um, I'll just say it this way. When you read the book of Revelation... I don't see anything in there about the Americas. Now, you may say, well, there's an eagle. Yeah, but it's not, it's not America. Uh, so what happens to us in end times? Some scholars believe we are the inept group because we're financially broke. Uh, we may not be taken over by another country, but we're so financially broke uh, that we can't do anything to really help in helping defend Israel. Uh, I do say, and I will say this, one of the reasons we have been a blessed nation is that in the United States, we have the second largest um, 
inhabitants of Jewish people is in the United States. And for the most part, the United States has always been standing with Israel. Um, I'm not going to tell you how to vote, but if somebody votes against Israel, you need to reconsider your vote because God's going to always stand with his people. Um, you, you're going to see real quickly that the kings of the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom are a disaster. And God punishes them and allows them to be disciplined. But the Bible very plainly tells us that God made a promise to Abraham. Well, let me ask you, do you think God's going to keep his promise to Abraham? You better believe that because he's made promises to us. And if he's going to break promises to Abraham, then maybe he could break promises to us. But God's not a promise breaker, amen? And the Abraham covenant is not a if-then covenant. An if-then covenant says, if you do this, then I will do this. Like the covenant with Moses. He told the Israelites then, if you do this, I will do this. I will give you the promised land and I will go before you and I will fight for you. And I, if you hold on to me, if you're obedient to me. So the Moses covenant is a, uh, an if-then covenant. It's contingent on the people being faithful. Abraham's covenant was not a contingent covenant. Okay, God said, I'm going to do this. Your salvation is not a contingent covenant. Aren't you glad? I'm so glad to know that my salvation is not dependent on whether I always do everything right. I had a buddy of mine, because let's just be honest, there are some denominations that think very highly of man's free will. And we do have free will. And so we have differences of opinion. But a buddy of mine who's talking with another Christian who felt like you could lose your salvation got in kind of a heated debate about that. And he said, so if I have unconfessed sins and I die, then I'm not going to go to heaven. This old boy said, that's right. He said, so on Saturday night, I could have confessed all my sins and been right with God and got up on Sunday morning and put on my best and prayed up and worshiped up. And I'm on my way to church and I drive by a woman jogging in a little bitty bikini and I look too long and have thoughts I shouldn't have, and I run off the road and hit a tree and die, I'm going to hell? Is that what you're telling me? Well, yeah, it's like, that's what he goes, my goodness, there's no grace in that. Uh, so we have to understand, and the reason I say that, we have to understand that God made a covenant with Abraham, and God's going to keep it. As a matter of fact, the end of the book says, they will look on him whom they've pierced, crucified, and they will mourn over him, like an only brother well that's going to be the jews that's not us because national national wise we're not his brother we're his brother spiritually but not nationally and so uh anyway all that say that so solomon starts off good but he goes downhill so real quickly i'm just going to show you this uh, picture the kings in red are israel's kings the kings in blue have the blue are judah's kings and to be honest with you, all the kings in northern Israel, the ten tribes, I'm going to just read to you a description in one of my commentaries. I want to read a description. I'm not even going to name all of them, but just listen. Nadab, bad. Elha, evil. Zimri, sinful. Ahab, the worst to this point. That's not saying much the worst to this point in other words it's going to get worse shalom full of vice pecan idolatrous there are none of the kings in the northern kingdom that any of the commentaries will rate as being a righteous king then you get down to the kings of judah and there are about seven or eight of those that are better listen to some of these descriptions rehoboam mostly bad abijah mostly perverted asa now he was good jehoshaphat he was righteous jehoraham terrible then you get down to jotham worthy ahaz heinous you just you get all of these descriptions of these guys and it was bad and why was it bad because they were leading the people of God away from God. 
Listen, Christians, you may not be a king tonight, but you're a leader in some, smart, some circle. And you, you may say, well, it's a small little circle. But all of us have some circle of influence. Let me tell you what God expects of you. First, you have a personal responsibility with your relationship with God. But then you have a personal, relation, a personal responsibility for those around you. Parents, first responsibility of discipleship making is your children. Amen? Grandparents, you're to help them. Great-grandparents, you're to help them. You're to love your children, love your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, but you're to point them to Christ. You're to lead them in that direction, not lead them away. Some of the saddest stories are when you hear these stories about people who grow up in this rough lifestyle and they send to the second generation in the same way and the third generation. I believe it was one of the Women's Hope Center's events that we went to one time, and there was a grandmother and her daughter, And a granddaughter. And they were telling their testimony. The grandmother said, I was one of the biggest drug dealers and one of the biggest pimps around the Trinity Lane area. When my daughter was young, I put a heroin needle in her arm so that she would become addicted to drugs and be like me because I didn't want her to be better than me. When she had our grandbaby, I gave her drugs Because I didn't want her to be better than me. I wanted her to follow in the same lifestyle that I... And it just broke my heart. I was sitting there going generation after generation after generation going through this treachery. Now the good news there, they've all been saved. They've reconciled and, and God has done a miracle there. But the point is, you and I have a sphere of influence. And at your job, you need to be pointing people to Christ. They don't have to accept Christ, but you need to be pointing people to Christ. You need to be acting like Christ. In your family, you need to be pointing people to Christ and acting like Christ. When you come to church, it would be really nice when you come to church if you would act like Christ and point others to Christ. We see all these leaders just doing the absolute worst things, leading a whole nation away from God. You know, I don't know how you feel about this, but again, sometimes it just I've gotten to the point where I quit watching the news. I just quit watching the news. And I really encourage my parents, if they're watching tonight, I encourage them, turn the news off. Because this stuff will just stress you out. When you start talking about our relationship with other nations and how, you know, do you you have a fence at the border and we have a fence at the border and then little babies are coming across the border and, and there's wire and so these people are cutting the wire so the babies can come and then all these other people come in and they're drug dealers and they're rapers and they're murderers and, and I'm telling you, you sit there and you listen to that stuff all the time and you're sitting there thinking, you just, you just want to get in a cocoon and hide in your house and say, I don't like this and I don't want this, but I don't, there's nothing I can do about it. And you feel that way. Well, there's something you can do about it. You can pray about it. I don't know why we think prayer is not important. You can pray about it. Because God can do anything he wants to. Amen? He can fix all these problems. So we need to pray about it. We need to make sure we're voting correctly. Okay? I'm not going to tell you how to vote. Just vote correctly. Vote for somebody who is going to, as best you can determine, going to be for the things for that God is for. Or against the things that God's against. And then... Work in your sphere. Work in your circle, okay? That's all we can do, but that's what we can do. Well, that's kind of how the kings messed up. The rest of this book is really interesting because we have this thing called the prophets. And there's two main prophets, and I'm going to spend some time talking about them because I really think they're inspirational for us because, again, they are standing almost singularly against the tide that's coming against them in their culture war uh, in their day. And so... Believe it or not, you and I can be like these two men. We're going to talk a little bit about Elijah and talk about Elijah. Again, a prophet was somebody who just reveals God's message to others. God's message to others. Did you know you can do that? Now, I'm not going to call you a prophet, okay, because sometimes we have theological debate about whether there's still the gift of prophecy and all that stuff in our world today. But I will say this. As a Christian, you know the truth, And you can share God's truth with other people. As a matter of fact, you're commanded to do so. See those words over there? Jesus didn't say, hey guys, if you have time. He says, make disciples. 
Make disciples. Do you know what your responsibility is tomorrow? Make a disciple. You're like, I don't know how to do that. Talk to people. Talk to people. Talk to them about what? Talk to them about spiritual things. You know what? If you see, if you see somebody doing something dumb and you know it's dumb, it's as bad for them, there's no doubt that this is bad for them, you look at them and go, you know, you probably shouldn't be doing that. But see, some of the times in our culture, oh, I don't know if I could say that. What if they don't like me? Well, it'd be a shame for them not to like you and spend an eternity in hell because you were too afraid to tell them, you know what, what you're doing is not good for you. See, we get to that place sometimes where we're like, we're so afraid to do anything that we don't do anything. And then, but we sit back and we twiddle our thumbs. And we say, oh, I wish these people would get saved. I, I wish those people over there. You know what? The best neighbors you can have are ones that aren't doing drugs, that aren't cheating on each other, aren't shooting each other. So why don't you go over and talk to them about Jesus? Because he can fix those things. You, can't, you can put up a biggest fence you want to, get you a dog that barks, put you an alarm system in, and they're still going to rob you blind. Or you can talk to him about Jesus and let him change them from the inside out. See, we have this responsibility. So let's talk about these guys. They're, they're, they're a lot of fun. Elijah. Elijah is kind of the wild man. I like the way he described that in the video. He's this wild, colorful person that really seems to kind of come out of nowhere. Now, that doesn't mean he didn't have parents. I love people who read the Bible like that and go, oh, he was straight from heaven. No, he had parents. He was a real man. He just kind of walks out onto the scene that they didn't really know him before, and he walks out onto the scene. He walks into Ahab's place of power. Oh, Jezebel's hanging out with him. Jezebel is still a name that most women do not want to name their daughters, by the way. Has a bad connotation, although you might be surprised. Don't Google it, but you might be surprised. Elijah walks in looks at him and says, because of what you're doing, because you're leading people astray, it's not going to rain again until I say so. And he turns around and walks out. Now that just takes some gumption, doesn't it? That just takes some gumption. It's not going to rain again until I say so. And he walks out. What's interesting is, is that when he walks out, God sends him into the wilderness. God sends Elijah into the wilderness and says, I want you to go into the wilderness and I want you to hang out by this creek. I think the original language says a wadi, but to me a wadi sounds like your drawers got messed up in your pants. And I just like creek, okay? You'll get that in a minute. A wadi, a wedgie, whatever. So he says, I want you to go hang out by the creek and I'm going to take care of you in the wilderness. Elijah goes, hangs out by the creek for a little while, and the creek dries up. Oh, by the way, before they had DoorDash, God had ravens that brought him food. And the creek dries up, and God says, I want you to go over here to this other land, and I want you to go find this widow woman. Now, why I think this is interesting is, in just a few statements in scripture this man goes from walking into literally what we would call the president's office walking into the king's throne room and saying it's not going to rain again until I say so man what power and authority God has given me this power and authority and not you but then we find this one who has spoken to the big platform God says now I want you to go to the wilderness and I want you to just trust me. And now I want you to go to a widow woman and her son. And there's where you're going to get to preach for the next three years. You don't think about it that way, do you? But that's exactly what happened to Elijah. You're on a big stage one moment. Now your whole congregation is a widow woman and her son. You remember the story. She was making a little meal. She had a little flour and a little oil. Elijah comes up, hey, what you doing? Well, I'm fixing to make one pancake, hoe cake. I'm fixing to make one hoe cake, and me and my son are going to eat it, and we're going to die because we're out. We don't have anything else. He says, why don't you make me one first? Isn't that a neat thing? 
God will always cause you to do ministry out of your poverty because he wants you to know it's not about what you have, it's about what he has. And she says, I got nothing to lose, man of God. Okay, this is my paraphrase, by the way. You go back and read this, you'll be like, that is not exactly how it said it. My paraphrase. Jesus was good at storytelling, I'm going to tell you a story. So, she didn't run out of oil and she didn't run out of flour. Matter of fact, it kept producing until it rained because God was teaching Elijah something, but God was also teaching the widow woman something. But in the midst of him having two people that he was preaching to, the boy dies. Isn't that how sometimes you just think, man, is this not going to get any worse? God, one day I'm, I'm preaching to the leader of the nation. And then you send me over here to preach to two people, and now you let one of them die. It's going, this is going, First Baptist going the wrong way. We, we're supposed to be adding people, and now we only had two people, and one of them died. Well, Elijah goes in and prays over this young boy, and his life is returned to him. That's what Elijah learned about in the wilderness the first time. Finally, God looked at Elijah and he says, time for you to go back and talk to King Ahab and Jezebel. And so we have Mount Carmel. We have that experience at Mount Carmel. Wonderful experience at Mount Carmel. You remember that because it was Elijah against the prophets of Baal, 450 prophets of Baal. And they decided to have this contest to see whose God was real. Elijah says, I tell you what, I'll let you go first. You sacrifice to your God and ask your God to prove that he is real. And so they build their altars and they pray and they're asking their God to, to talk to them and show to himself. And he does not at all. You know why? Because he's not a, really a God. Do you know all the things that we make as gods in our lives aren't really a God at all? Your 401k, I don't care how big it is, it can't cure your cancer. It can't fix your problems. You can go to the gym every day and pump iron and drink protein shakes and do the best that you can do. You know what? You still can't outrun the problems of this world because those gods fail. Our God never fails. So Elijah, just being the little smarty pants he was, he walks around and goes, is your God asleep? Literally in the Hebrew text, maybe he's out relieving himself. Your God's got a gut ache and the reason he can't respond to you. Maybe he's taking a nap. And at the end of that, Elijah's like, y'all quit. It's my turn. And these guys got into it. They were cutting themselves and crying out to their God. I mean, they were into it. Nothing happened. God's, Elijah says, let me, let me show you who really is God. Built an altar brings the sacrifice but he said just so you know God is God let's pour a bunch of water over the sacrifice and they did and then Elijah played a very simple prayer he didn't have to do a dance he didn't have to cut himself he didn't have to wait very long God sent fire down from heaven and what did it do consumed the whole thing didn't it consumed the whole thing it's called a mountain high experience. If you ever talk about spiritually a mountain high experience, Elijah had a mountain high experience with God on Mount Carmel, right? Right after that, he gets some of the Israelites to get excited about God. They kill the prophets of Baal. Mountain high experience. But you know what happened right after his mountain high experience? Elijah got word that Jezebel had put a price on his head. You have done messed up my social club. You have messed up my authority. I'm going to get you, sucker. And he went to his second wilderness hiding. And this is what I want you to hear tonight. Second wilderness hiding. This time, he doesn't go to the wilderness because God sent him. He goes to the wilderness because he sent himself. I want you to stop and think about that. Evaluate this in your own life. Has there ever been a time God sent you to a wilderness? 
If he did, it's for your good. If you've ever sent your own self to a wilderness, it's never for your good. Typically, we go to a wilderness because we're disappointed in God, we don't believe God, and we want to complain against God. And that's exactly what Elijah did. He ran. He ran from God. He was depressed. One of the reasons I love to to study Elijah is because you see these swings of emotion that are real in most people. Spiritual highs, physical lows, spiritual lows, depression. He goes into this depression and cries out to God and basically said, I'm the only one. I'm the only person that even believes in you. I'm the only one. And God's, God's like, son, you're not the only one. There's several more out there that believe in me. But he sent these different things in front of Elijah. You remember there was a firestorm, there was thunder, there was a great wind. None of those things was God's spirit. But then the spirit of God spoke in what? A still, small voice. At the end of that, Elijah was tired. And he's like, I don't want to preach anymore. God said, okay, I'll let you do that. I've got somebody else by the name of Elisha. Let's look at, let's look at a little bit of uh, when Elijah turns over his ministry to Elisha. He said, Elijah took his mantle, he rolled it up, and he struck the waters which parted to the right and to the left. In other words, he took his mantle off, which was a piece of clothing, he struck the water, and the water parted. So you thought the only water parting was at the Red Sea and at the Jordan River. Well, it happened here. The waters parted. And the two of them crossed over on dry ground. After they had crossed over, Elijah said to Elijah, Tell me what I can do for you before I am taken from you. So Elisha answered and said, Please let me inherit two shares of your spirit. And Elijah replied to him, You have asked for something difficult. If you see me being taken from you, you will have it. If not, you won't. And so as they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire with horses of fire suddenly appeared and separated the two of them. Then Elijah went up into heaven, into the whirlwind. Can I stop right there? That was not a helicopter. I had a teacher in high school that wanted to convince me that there was time travel and he could prove it because The fiery chariot was either a rocket or a helicopter because in a whirlwind. He had already figured this out in his mind. There was time travel. And I'm like, no, there's a God. And he sent a fiery chariot. Let's just keep it simple, okay? So notice it says, as Elijah watched, he kept crying out, My father, my father, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. Then he never saw Elijah again, and he took a hold of his own clothes, and he tore them into pieces. And Elijah picked up the mantle that had fallen off of Elijah and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the mantle Elijah had dropped and struck the waters. Where is the the Lord God of Elijah, he asked. And he struck the waters himself and they parted to the right and to the left and Elijah crossed over. And when the sons of the prophets from Jericho who were facing him saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elijah. Now this phrase, the spirit of Elijah, will carry over in the New Testament to who? The forerunner of Jesus, John the Baptist, right? But she's right too because people thought Jesus was Elijah. So uh, to meet him and they bowed down to the ground in front of him. So Let's talk just a little bit about Elijah. Again, kind of a a unique character. Do you notice his uh, hairdo? That's a real picture, by the way. The reason I point that out, did you know one of the things that he did was he cursed some young boys who were making fun of his bald head. And when he did... Some bear cubs came out and mauled those little smart aleck teenagers. Wouldn't you like to have that ability? Some smart aleck teenager, you could just curse them and something, squirrels would come out and attack them or something like that. I mean, that'd be kind of cool. But some of the things that Elisha did, uh, he healed the waters of Jericho. They were bitter. He healed, the, he healed them. Uh, he multiplied a widow's oil. There was also a widow, great story. Matter of fact, uh, gosh, I don't have time to share this. Matter of fact, I shared this with our staff on uh, Monday morning in our staff meeting, but she was mad 
because her husband had been in ministry. He was a Levite. She was mad. My husband's died. We didn't make much money being in the ministry. We have nothing. They're coming to collect everything, take us off into debtor's prison. And Elijah, Elisha said, go collect a bunch of containers and take what oil you have and begin to fill them up, right? And they did, and they paid off all their debt. What I told my staff, and I'll just tell you, we're to pour ourselves out into other people, aren't we? You're, you're to pour your life out into other people, and that's hard. Making disciples is hard. It will cost you something. It'll cost you some time. It'll cost you some tears because people aren't going to do all what you want them to do. They're not going to respond as quickly as you want them to. It's going to cost you something. And sometimes we give out so much that we just don't know, where am I going to get filled up? You get filled up where the oil got filled up from the Heavenly Father. Okay? He'll fill you up. If you keep pouring yourself out, he'll fill you up. So Elijah did that. He also uh, brought a um, son, a son of a, a woman back to life. Uh, he removed poison from a pot of stew. Uh, he multiplied 20 barley loaves, uh, feeding, five, or feeding 100 men. He cured Naaman. He made an axe head float in the water. All that stuff to show the power that these guys had. Uh, and the reason I wanted to point that out to you is because it points us forward to who Jesus is. Do you remember what Jesus asked the apostles? Who do people say that I am? Who do people say that I am? And they said to him, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And then he turned around and he says, but who do you say that I am? And that's where Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. What's interesting is that Jesus knows that his ministry is similar to Elijah, to Jeremiah, to John's. But he's trying to point out that he is so much more. Where Elisha could feed 100 men with 20 loaves, Jesus could feed 5,000 with a sack lunch. He did some of the same types of miracles, but he did it in much greater way with much authority because he is the, the God-man. It's interesting, just a note for you. Um, remember, Elisha said, I won't double whatever you've gotten in your power and your authority. I won't double of that. And Elisha did a lot of things. Matter of fact, his ministry lasted longer than Elijah. But did you know that Elijah, the prophet, is mentioned about 30 times in the New Testament? Elisha is only mentioned once. Only once. Jesus said, just like they didn't receive Elisha in his hometown, you're not going to receive me in my hometown either. So um, it's just kind of interesting. Elijah typically is the one that we think about that represents the prophets. So that's the book of Kings, First and Second Kings. What does it point us to? It points us to who Jesus is. It points us to who Jesus is. See, Elijah, he got tired. He wanted to quit. Our prophet never gets tired, never wants to quit. Solomon started off good, failed miserably. A lot of other kings, they didn't even start off good. They just failed miserably. Our king of kings and lord of lords started off great. He's going to end great. It points out to us that we really need this leader that's more than just a man. We need the God-man. So what's the Old Testament all about? It points us to Christ. Always has. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. To show you how little we have to say to someone to bring about something else in them. I was at a physical therapy appointment today, and this lady's cell phone was about to come out of her pocket. So I said, are you about to lose your cell phone? And then we had a conversation about so she runs out to my car with tears streaming down her face and says, 
Yeah. That's right. That's right. Thank you, Myra. That's a great. You're you're a representation of Christ everywhere you go. We talked about this this morning in our small group. You know, I don't always do this, but I've tried to, and I'll be I'll be honest. I've tried to force myself because, believe it or not, most pastors are kind of introverted. We stand up here and we have to talk a lot. And so when I go to eat lunch or I go on vacation, I don't want to talk to anybody about anything. I want to be quiet. But I've tried to force myself when I go to lunch or go somewhere, especially somebody, they have to talk to me. Can I get you something to drink? Da, da. Try to compliment them. Thank you. How's your day going? Can I pray for you about something? Well, the other day, a young lady walks up. Can I pray for you about something? She's like, you know what? Things are going pretty good. Appreciate you asking. But then she came back and she's like, do you know this person? Yeah, I do. They're in our church. I thought, I thought that. I said, why don't you come visit with us sometime? That was the extent of our conversation. I did not get an opportunity to give a full gospel presentation because as soon as we had that, she had to go wait on another table. Don't beat up on yourself and try to make it like, I've got to get down the gospel road. I've got to, I've got to share with them. You know what you've got to do? You've got to just take time to show that you care. And then just pay attention. If that lady hadn't followed you out to the car, you'd have gotten in your car and gone home. You did what you were supposed to do. Hey, your cell phone's about to fall out, baby. I don't want you to lose your phone. But because you did that, she wanted to carry on a conversation. That's all we have to do. Just be polite to people. Try to work into some conversation of how blessed you feel or can I pray for you. Or, Man, I just see there's something on your face. Is something, And if they look at you and go, you're weird, leave me alone. You know what you do? You leave them alone. But they might look at you and go, I can't believe you did this. I am going through a, a rough patch right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you guys for being here tonight. Let me close this and we'll be dismissed. God, you are so good. And I'm so grateful that we don't have to trust in any human being to be our prophet, to be our priest, to be our king. We can trust in the King of kings and Lord of lords. We can trust in the God-man. We can trust in our Savior. We can trust in Jesus Christ, who does it perfect every time, all the time. God, give us those opportunities as we go on our way to say something, to be something for somebody else, to help them to get to know you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.